Hello everyone. This is in response to a recent video by up-and-coming alt-right content creator Keith Woods, which stands as the first part of a critique of Marxism. This episode in particular is concerned with Marx's ethics. Keith insinuates that Marx's ethics are incoherent. He is not only wrong, he is incoherent himself in the course of making his arguments as we shall see. And this incoherence is born, ultimately, I will argue, of a general bigotry against Marx quite common among the right, and I see this video as in fact a helpful opportunity to correct some misconceptions and one-sided judgments that prevail about Marx's work. Because at the very least, I'll give Keith this much credit. He is not actually, I think, stupid enough to have made this video if he was actually trying. I hope he can take these critiques as a call to clean up his act, and to stop helping cruel know-nothings to poison the well against sincere people trying to solve real problems. So much for my introduction, let's get into it. There is a contradiction at the heart of the Marxist approach to morality. That is, for Marx, morality represents a deceptive abstraction from the particular circumstances and material interests that it serves. Morality, for Marx, belongs to the ideological superstructure of society. Resting upon the economic base, the superstructure is composed of morality, ethics, religion, the state, political struggles within society as well as forms of consciousness corresponding to each of those. These phenomena are themselves the result or the expression of the actual social relations of the means of production. In the German ideology, Marx writes of how, quote, The account of the production of ideas in the German ideology starts from the claim that thought, including moral thought, is always constrained by the conditions and circumstances under which it is produced. The production of ideas, of conceptions, of consciousness, is at first directly interwoven with the material activity and the material intercourse of men, the language of real life. Conceiving, thinking, the mental intercourse of men, appear at this stage as the direct efflux of their material behaviour. The same applies to mental production as expressed in the language of politics, laws, morality, religion, metaphysics, etc. of a people. Yet, throughout the writings of Marx and Engels, they again and again express scathing moral judgments on capitalism and the bourgeoisie. Indeed, even the term exploitation, so important to Marxian analysis, would seem to add a moral dimension to the economic analysis it accompanies. So on the one hand, Marx believes that morality, being a form of ideology, is socially constructed to suit the needs of the ruling class of a given epoch, and thus illusory and temporal in nature. Yet much of Marx's writings contain a frequent appeal to the reader's sense of indignation and sympathy. It is an elementary Marxist belief that moral intuitions will be prime candidates for class-related bias. There is to be no good Marxist reason to suppose that such intuitions are universally shared. Engels is no less contradictory when discussing the subject of morality. Engels claimed that, quote, all moral theories have been hitherto the product, in the last analysis, of the economic conditions of society obtaining at the time. And as society has hitherto moved in class antagonisms, morality has always been class morality. Yet Engels also did not spare his indignation at the injustices of capitalism. We can look no further than his work The Condition of the Working Class in England which abounds in moral criticism of the social conditions being created by new industrial capitalism. And Marx himself found inspiration in this work, and praised it for exposing, quote, the moral degradation caused by the capitalistic exploitation of women and children. The Marxist author Edward Thompson also observed this apparent paradox, noting that, Quote, the silence of Marx, and of most Marxists, is so loud as to be deafening. Marx, in his wrath and compassion, was a moralist in every stroke of his pen. Thompson suggests that Marx and Engels' opposition to 
the pervasive moralism of Victorian capitalism led them to this neglect and silence. And we may add to this paradox the observation that Marx was not just a detached observer forecasting the necessary collapse of capitalism, but he was actively engaged in trying to further revolutionary activity in his lifetime. Moreover, in his speeches to revolutionary communist organisations, Marx often engaged in moralistic language, summoning the rights of man and excoriating the injustices wrought by the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. If Marx were to be consistent in his rejection of moralism, what would justify using such language? Moreover, what would justify engaging in any kind of revolutionary praxis to begin with? So the charge here is effectively of hypocrisy. Marx conceives of morality as downstream from an economic base and ultimately in the service of a ruling class, effectively making the argument of Thrasymachus in Plato's Republic that justice is nothing but the advantage of the stronger. Nonetheless, Marx deploys language that targets the reader's empathy, even evoking a sense of indignation. There are two mistakes going on in Keith's reasoning here, one minor and one major. The minor mistake is that Keith is conflating that which appeals to the passions with morality. It may be the case that a reader thoroughly inculcated in the moral sensibilities of a given time and place might react emotionally to some of Marx's more florid lines in a way that might seem, in our parlance, to imply adherence to some kind of transcendent morality. This is immaterial to the question, however. Such a reader is simply embellishing the text with their own cultural baggage, and their anger may nonetheless be justified in response to the frustrating fact of the case that they are indeed successfully being exploited, as well as those whom they love or have an interest in seeing succeed. The major point is that Keith demonstrates here that he doesn't really understand Marx's critique of morality. Morality does indeed, for Marx, follow from and serve the ruling class, but this in itself isn't an argument that morality doesn't exist, but only an explanation of how morality exists and what it is. So if we denude this word ruling, quote-unquote, of some of its oppressive implications, there is nothing intrinsically wrong or contradictory about a moral system that serves the interest of one class on Marx's view, provided, that is, that there is only one class. You see, morality is supposed to be universal. If that morality is downstream from the interests and way of life of a universal class, then there's no problem, because being of a universal class, it is indeed a universal morality. If, however, that morality is downstream from the interests of one class against the interests of another, then contrary to its pretensions, it is not universal, and is no moral system in fact, but merely an ideological byproduct and tool of that class's domination. So if Marx infers a universal class, even in potentia, then he is perfectly within his rights to appeal to a moral sense that finds its morality in the interests of that universal class, even if by some lights he does so prematurely. This is indeed how all ethical theory is done, for if the ethical society producing a proper understanding of morality already existed, there would be no need for ethical or moral theory. Marx is additionally well within his rights to oppose the moralism of others with a moralism of his own, insofar as that is rooted in the interest of a universal class and charges the moralistic advocates of exploitative classes that the pretensions of their moral sentences to universality are just that. He in effect accuses them of hypocrisy and utilizes their own moral sentences against them. Now Keith notes something interesting in a rather stripped-down reference to the critique of Marx levied by E.P. Thompson in his essay, The Poverty of Theory. Now, Keith only references Thompson's less important remarks on Marx's apparent hypocrisy in moralizing against moralists, where the really interesting critique lies just above these remarks, and that is that Marx attributed conflicts in morality to conflicts of class interest alone. Thompson argues that there is an additional factor Marx and the various forms of Marxism miss in the form of what he called values. And the deafening silence of Marx and the Marxists is of the fact that in addition to a conflict of interests arising from a material need, every class struggle is also a conflict of values arising from wants, from feelings. 
Now, at the risk of sounding pretentious, this seems to me to be a misreading of Marx on Thompson's part, as our passionate responses to moral conflicts are surely also downstream from class interest in Marx's reasoning. And again, to accuse Marx of moralism is merely to accuse him of not keeping his attitude in line with his reasoning. At worst, this amounts to a charge of bad manners. But moreover, even if we accept Thompson's critique on his own terms, this does not render Marx's position vis-a-vis -vis morality incoherent, but merely incomplete and standing in need of further elaboration. This criticism could extend to all Marxists who have followed Marx's command and taken their revolutionary conclusions to the streets. How can self-sacrifice for long-range goals like the establishment of communism, be justified within their own materialist worldview. If the collapse of capitalism and the coming of communism is an inevitable historical process, what is the motivation for committed Marxists to make any kind of sacrifice to bring it about? This argument is very simply dispensed with. Again, the contradiction in bourgeois morality is that, in its claims to universality, it sugars over the oppression of some particular class by some particular class. For the revolutionary who identifies with the universal class, there is no conflict between class interest and morality. In addition, Keith is engaging in what Marx and Hegel would call a one-sided analysis. He conceives of the movement of history as apart from the movement of class struggle, while Marx is adamant that the movement of class struggle is the movement of history. He is not saying that communism is inevitable, let us bring it about. He is saying that capitalism is scaffolded by ideological contradictions that can only carry for so long, and empirically the movement historically has been toward the raising of lower classes to ever more universal status, which today is the other side of the same coin in which a preposterous majority of the world's wealth lies in the hands of such a tiny few. It's a really elementary observation. The amount of sand removed from a hole corresponds to the amount of empty space left within it, and that space correspondingly diminishes in proportion as you put the sand back in. Marx's successors were no less contradictory in their treatment of morality. Here, Keith retrieves the same argument one more time, albeit concerning Lenin's moralism. I'll leave it in for completeness, but we'll speed it up a bit because he talks really slow and because an actually interesting critique follows. Take the most successful successor, Vladimir Lenin. In a 1920 speech, Lenin said, quote, we said that our morality is entirely subordinated to the interests of the proletariat's class struggle. Morality is what serves to destroy the old, exploiting society and to unite all the working people around the proletariat, which is building up a new, communist society. To a communist, all morality lies in this united discipline and conscious mass struggle against the exploiters. We do not believe in an eternal morality, and we expose the falseness of all the fables about morality. Yet on the other hand, Lenin's writings are also full of passionate moral denunciations of the ills of capitalism, as when he wrote in 1917 of, quote, these survivals of a cursed capitalist society these dregs of humanity, these hopeless decayed and atrophied limbs, this contagion, this plague, this ulcer that socialism has inherited from capitalism. Okay, now that's done with, pay attention, because this part actually has substance. Another of Marx's most influential followers, Leon Trotsky, dealt with the question of Marx's morality directly in an exchange with the influential philosopher John Dewey. Previously, in his 1920 writing Terrorism and Communism, Trotsky coldly expressed the revolution's rejection of traditional morality. Quote, As for us, we were never concerned with the Kantian priestly and vegetarian Quaker prattle about sacredness of human life. We were revolutionaries in opposition and have remained revolutionaries in power. To make the individual sacred, we must destroy the social order which crucifies him. And this problem can only be solved by blood and iron. In his 1938 essay, Their Morals and Ours, which served as his response to John Dewey, Trotsky asks the reader to agree that morality is a product of social development, that there is nothing invariable about it, that it serves social interests, that these interests are contradictory, that morality, more than any other form of ideology, has a class character. Although Trotsky briefly acknowledges that, quote, elementary moral precepts exist, worked out in the development of mankind as an integral element necessary for the life of every collective body, the influence of these norms is extremely limited and unstable. Norms, obligatory upon all, become less forceful the sharper the character assumed by the class struggle. 
The highest pitch of the class struggle is civil war, which explodes into mid-air all moral ties between the hostile classes. To quote from Stephen Luke's Marxism and Morality, In short, like Marx, Engels, Kotsky and Lenin, Trotsky was committed on the one hand to the moral condemnation of capitalist evils and the advocacy and pursuit of socialist ends, and indeed to the justification of these ends in terms of a liberating morality, and on the other hand to the dismissal of all moral talk as dangerous ideological illusion, rendered anachronistic by the discovery of scientific laws of economic development. For Trotsky, the revolutionary, the end always justifies the means, and the end of a communist revolution and the liberation of the proletariat trumps all other ends. Quote, that is permissible, we answer, which really leads to the liberation of mankind. Since this end can be achieved only through revolution, the liberating morality of the proletariat is, of necessity, endowed with a revolutionary character. But how are we to judge which actions are permissible in pursuit of revolution and which are not? Trotsky's view was that there could be no automatic answers. Quote, Problems of revolutionary morality are fused with problems of revolutionary strategy. The living experience of the movement under the clarification of theory provides the correct answer to these problems. The end flows naturally from the historical movement. Organically, the means are subordinated to the end. So a quick correction. The argument here is consistent with what we've seen in Marx already. Morality has a class character, that is, it is emergent from class interests, and the norms insisted upon by an oppressor class have no weight as class struggle comes to a head. Hence, while Trotsky does deny the proposition that human life is sacred, he does so because bourgeois morality uses the proposition that human life is sacred to nip in the bud attempts to put a stopper to their own blaspheming against the sacred exploiting of that very same human life. Hence, to make the individual truly sacred, the social order which crucifies him, quote-unquote, must be dismantled. The ends don't always justify the means for Trotsky, since morality has a class character, means which satisfy the interests of one's class are tautologically justified, and insofar as one's class is universal, one's morality is universal. Ipso facto, only those means which serve the interest of the universal class, of mankind in the most universal sense, are justified. Someone may retort that Trotsky himself was as pretentious, ultimately, as the Victorian moralists against Marx himself railed, and maybe that's true, but the argument as such remains coherent. Now here comes the actually interesting objection by John Dewey, and it's a bit subtler than Keith treats it, and he abandons it later on, unfortunately. But pay attention, because this is important. In Dewey's response, he exposed the problem that Trotsky, and by extension most Marxists, did not subject means and ends to the kind of examination that could allow a rational discussion about whether the means were justified or not. Although Dewey was himself a consequentialist, he pointed out that there were two different types of consequentialism being discussed. And a brief aside, a consequentialist in moral philosophy is essentially someone that believes that ends justify means, that the way to judge the morality of a particular action is the outcome that it creates. So, as mentioned, for Dewey, there are basically two kinds of consequentialism that differentiate himself from Trotsky. A means could be a means to an end, that is, objective, observable consequences, which is the kind of consequentialism that Dewey subscribes to, or it could be a means to what he calls an end in view. And clearly Trotsky's consequentialism was of this latter kind. Now, if the goal was simply the liberation of mankind as the end in view, then, to quote Dewey, There would be an examination of all means that are likely to attain this end without any fixed preconceptions as to what they must be, and that every suggested means would be weighed and judged on the express ground of the consequences it is likely to produce. However, Dewey noticed that, on the contrary, means are deduced from an independent source, an alleged law of history which is the law of all laws of social development. Quote, since the class struggle is regarded as the only means that will reach the end, 
And since the view that it is the only means is reached deductively and not by an inductive examination of the means or consequences in their interdependence, the means, the class struggle, does not need to be critically examined with regard to its actual objective consequences. This leaves us only with an end in view, which justifies any means in line with the class struggle. Dewey claims Trotsky's argument is circular. Quote, it is as if a biologist or a physician were to assert that certain law of biology which he accepts is so related to the end of health that the means of arriving at health, the only means, can be deduced from it, so that no further examination of biological phenomena is needed. The whole case is prejudged. Trotsky and orthodox Marxists in general, in Dewey's view, held an unjustified certainty that the end in view of a communist society was not only possible, but inevitable and imminent, as well as another unjustified certainty about what means were required to bring it into being. Because of the certainty of the inevitability of history, and the eventual triumph of communism being on their side, any manner of heinous acts could be justified if in service of this final end. This kind of messianism is reminiscent of religious fanatics, which may go some way to explaining the kind of fervour that Marxism has conjured up in its followers, an observation that led Dewey himself to conclude that, quote, Orthodox Marxism shares with Orthodox religionism and with traditional idealism the belief that human ends are interwoven into the very texture and structure of existence. So it was, according to Dewey, that Orthodox Marxists transferred their allegiance from the ideals of socialism and a rational assessment of the means of attaining them to the class struggle as a law of historical change, which makes all the moral questions, that is, all the questions of the end to be finally attained, meaningless. To put this argument more concisely, generally, as consequentialists, we judge the morality of an action by its relation to some interest as an end, and we determine our actions by carefully and pragmatically assessing which action would most likely conduce to that end. However, Dewey observes that revolutionaries often don't do this. Instead, by invoking the inevitability of history, historical materialism can be used by revolutionaries to elide the question of whether individual acts taken by those revolutionaries are justified on these pragmatic grounds by superimposing the class struggle itself as the means of which these individual acts of violence are mere instances. Like the physician who believes that the only means of arriving at health is by way of a single law of biology, the revolutionary who believes that the only way history progresses is by class struggle too often ceases his examination at that point and fails to examine whether or not any one particular action will itself serve or impinge upon the interests of the universal class. However, this is not an error of theory, but of praxis. The physician errs in referring treatment to a single law of biology since his profession, his job, is the treatment of symptoms and the diseases which cause them, not a description of biological laws. That is the task of the biologist. Similarly, the revolutionary errs in assuming that a theory of history stands as an adequate substitute for the locally specific and pragmatic task set before him in forwarding the interests of the universal class. Theory concerns universals. Praxis concerns adapting the universal principles discovered by theory to the particular conditions in which the actor in history finds himself. What Dewey astutely observes is not a flaw in any theory as such, but rather an intrinsic danger in its misuse as a stand-in for serious consideration of the facts of any given particular case. It's a serious argument, but far from touching the coherence of Marx's approach to ethics, it only pinpoints one possible danger, albeit a very serious one, in its misapplication. Moral questions aren't rendered meaningless, but contextually meaningful. The lesson is not that there is no right or wrong, but that we must be clear as to where our understanding of right and wrong is derived, because it is always derived from somewhere. Which is why when trying to locate the moral qua the moral, Kant found it only in a good will, i.e., the good willed as such, denuded of even the particularity of humanity. Although the contradiction between Marx's pronouncements on morality 
and their behaviour and tendency to appeal to moral sensibilities is clear, there is nevertheless a certain ethic which can be drawn from Marx's writings. As some have called this an ethic of freedom or emancipation. So if we are to sketch out what the Marxist ethic is, judged by their behaviour and the inner logic of their revolutionary activities, and in spite of their own outward rejections of moralism, what would that look like? Firstly, Marxism is obviously consequentialist, believing that the means are always justified by the end. One only needs to look at the actions of the Bolsheviks, the Khmer Rouge or the Maoist Great Leap Forward to see this in action, though Trotsky's written defence of ends over means is one particularly straightforward explication of this principle. This is more than a little bit frustrating as Keith has just given us an account of a very strong argument by John Dewey for why these particular actors aren't cases of genuine consequentialism, but are rather determinists, who don't really entertain moral questions at all, but elide them inappropriately by referring responsibility for their actions to the historical class struggle. However, the consequentialism of Marxism is not so much utilitarian as the consequentialism of Miller Bentham, but as seen with Trotsky's dialogue with Dewey, it is rather perfectionist. In the words of Stephen Luke's quote, the best overall outcome is the maximal realization of human powers, of many sided individuality, in community, the attainment of a society in which the full and free development of every individual forms the ruling principle. So this is concisely, in essence, the end that the Marxists are driving towards. This is the full realization of communism and the end of history, and it's on the basis of this moral ideal that much of the rest of Marxist ethics uh, flows. Although Marx himself treats explicit answers to questions of what kind of society will be created by communism as utopian, Marxism contains implicit views of justice, exploitation and alienation, which presuppose a certain kind of freedom which communism is intended to bring about. And although Engels claims that all morality hitherto has been class morality, he speaks of the revolution bringing about a higher kind of morality, which he calls a really human morality. So what is this really human morality? As noted, many of Marx's criticisms of capitalism suggest various moral values. It could be claimed that Marx thought capitalism was unjust and that it robbed workers of the products of their labour, or that Marx opposed capitalism as an affront to human dignity. Other values suggested by Marx's criticisms of capitalism are equality, brotherhood, love, and even a kind of base utilitarianism in that capitalism did not promote the greatest good for the greatest many. But most central to Marx's criticism of capitalism is that it robs people of freedom. In fact, his early as well as his later writings are filled with references to the lack of freedom, the illusory freedom, the slavery that constitutes and results from capitalism. And some of the other values, such as justice, could even be seen as derivative from his primary ethical value of freedom. Marx claims that, quote, Communism, as fully developed naturalism, is said to equal humanism. It is said to be the genuine resolution of the conflict between man and nature and between man and man. The true resolution of the strife between freedom and necessity. Marx calls man's freedom the positive power to assert his true individuality, and this true individuality is man at the height of his powers and needs, exploiting nature and engaging in creative labour in cooperation with his fellow man. In the book Marx's Ethics of Freedom, the ethic is explained as such, quote, What then is it to be free in Marx's sense? Stated most concisely, it is for one to live such that one essentially determines, within communal relations to other people, the concrete totality of desires, capacities and talents which constitute one's self-objectification. In the brief passages where Marx describes what a communist society will look like, there is an emphasis on the freedom of the individual to practice mastery over nature, a freedom which is predicated on the elimination of of social demands on the individual's time and labour power. Quote, free time, disposable time, is wealth in itself, partly for the enjoyment of the product, partly for the free activity which, unlike labour, is not dominated by the pressure of an extraneous purpose which must be fulfilled, 
and fulfilment of which is regarded as a natural necessity or social duty according to one's inclinations. And so, to put it more simply for Marx, real freedom, as opposed to what he would call the bourgeois conception of freedom, is emancipation from what he calls extraneous purposes. But this raises an important question, namely, what makes a purpose count as extraneous? What are individuals' non-extraneous purposes? Are there not natural necessities which people must fulfil to maintain a social order? Are my obligations to family members extraneous purposes? And is it conceivable that social duties could disappear, even in the world of post-scarcity and abundance that the communists foresee? Sure, that's certainly possible, but again, Keith is falling into a one-sided mode of analysis, treating social and familial obligations as if these stood apart from a maximal human flourishing rather than being constitutive parts of it. He even gives a quote from Luke's that makes this explicit. The best overall outcome is the maximal realization of human powers, of many-sided individuality, in community. Keith is curiously showing his hand as a thoroughbred liberal here, for whom community is simply a thing one has as a possession, not a thing of which one's individuality is both a part, and which is in turn a part of one's individuality. Recall for a second one of the Trotsky quotes Keith cited in the previous section. Quote, organically, the means are subordinated to the end, unquote. This word organically is doing a lot of work here. In Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel conceives organic being as a process of reflecting into itself. Human communities are organic. There is no ontic priority in either individual flourishing and communal flourishing. The two give rise to each other in time, and the organic life of the society, which is explicitly an organism in Marx's as well as in Hegel's thought, lies in its status as the middle term linking the two. If the two are indeed separate, then we have either not escaped our alienation, or we have been alienated anew by something else. This again, to put it simply, doesn't stand as a critique of Marx. In the Grundrisse uh, uh, early work by Marx, he speaks of, quote, the general reduction of the necessary labour of society to a minimum, which then corresponds to the artistic, scientific, etc., development of the individuals in the time set free, and with the means created for all of them. So again, you see this ethic of freedom in Marx. The ideal is very much that with the progress of industrialism and capitalism, and it is important to note that Marx saw capitalism as a, a necessary stage of history and the, its capability of developing our productive capacities uh, in terms of industrial production and so on was necessary to bring about the kind of post-scarcity economy uh, that would bring about communism. Uh, so here again, you see the Marxist ethic of freedom. It is people having uh, complete control over nature, uh, living in abundance, and then with that abundance, having the freedom to explore their range of uh, possibilities and talents and to uh, live in harmony with this extended community and uh, bring out the best of their talents and capabilities. But this raises further questions. Will individuals be given freedom of access to external means of self-development? Uh, namely, will there be equality of opportunity? Or rather, will whatever resources are needed to be put to work to maximise the universal development of the greatest many in society uh, be the end? So, will there be a principle of equality of outcome? Now, because Marx seems to have presented a distributary principle in his conception of freedom, surely someone will have to decide how this distribution is calculated. Marx himself was a fan of direct democracy, and the standard communist answer would be that these decisions will be decided by all. But this just seems to raise further questions about how this would be coordinated, by what method. Although Marx was a fan of direct democracy, he never actually explained how collective decision-making would function under communism. Of course, Marxists write off such practical questions as utopian in outlook. But these questions show an undeveloped ethic in Marxism, which often seems at odds with other positions held by Marxists. Marx promises his followers a future of harmony, and with the end of history brought about by communism, an end to the social conflict wrought by previous modes of production. Quote, 
With the abolition of the basis, private property, with the communistic regulation of production and implicit in this the abolition of the alien attitude of men to their product, the power of the relation of supply and demand is dissolved into nothing, and men once more gain control of exchange, production and the way they behave to one another. But can we really imagine that there will be no other sources of conflict of interest which will not disappear with economic transformation? Could this economic transformation not itself generate new, previously unthought of sources of conflict and special interests? To quote Stephen Lukes again, quote, even supposing a real community to exist, what are its distinctive social relations? Are they face-to-face relations or do they hold between strangers? Are they intimate or anonymous? Are they relations of friendship, love, neighborliness, comradeship or kinship? or of class, ethnicity, nationality, citizenship, or common humanity? Do they hold between producers, or between producers and consumers, or between citizens? Are the relations of commitment and loyalty binding members to sub-communities, or the community as a whole? If the society in question is of any complexity, if indeed it is a society, then the only possible answer is, at least all of these. How then, will these interests and relations intersect? The Marxists seems to presuppose that conflict between them will be absent. Indeed, conflict between them is only present now because of capitalism. But will people continue to have real organic ties outside of the economic system? When will friendship override citizenry? When will internationalism conflict with localism? When will the priority of one's own family conflict with the demands of humanity? And how are these conflicts to be mediated? Perhaps more importantly, how can these conflicts ultimately be resolved without an appeal to some universal standard of justice and distributive moral principles? And so we're back to a communist society, needing the same kind of law that it claims to be a mere spook of capitalist class relations. And we're again back to the search for a principle of distributive justice of a universal kind which Marxists repudiate. Marx himself associates the need for justice with private property in the state. Therefore, any freedom that still requires principles of justice just demonstrates precisely that it is not yet sufficiently universal and concrete. But whether it is possible to organise a just social order without some principles of justice seems far from a foregone conclusion. And the Marxist refusal to engage with these kinds of questions on the basis of their utopian character only adds to the poverty of their answers to these moral questions. Well, first of all, it merits consideration that until very recently in our history, the very white nationalism to which Keith and his associates subscribe was impossible. Class struggle in industrial England was a division within a homogeneously white society. There was no association based on skin color, no loyalty based on some postulated common racial interest. To take this much further back, it was only slightly less recently in our history that nobody in the world identified more with their political community than with their clan. In the 5th century BC, the tyrant Cleisthenes in Athens divided up the holdings of the powerful clans into daimois, arbitrarily defined regions incorporating a variety of types of land and denizen. Citizens now voted for the interests of their daimois and came to identify more with the community of which they were a part by law, rather than that to which they belonged by blood. Today, enormous numbers of us identify with the interests of whole states. For better or worse, our nationalisms and our patriotisms are oriented around huge and arbitrarily delineated territories filled with untold numbers of strangers who we nonetheless identify with as being in some sense on our team. Now, we're increasingly deeply skeptical of the legitimacy of such connections, of course, but the point stands. This can be done. A productive and positive identity with a community at large not tied to us by blood or soil can be established, and it would not be new to us to accomplish this. Now, could the transition into a global communism introduce new and unthought-of sources of conflict? I mean, I suppose, but how would anyone answer this? The question is loaded with the premise of our effective blindness. 
And is this an argument for it not standing as a viable solution for destructive and wasteful sources of conflict now existing? I think not. There is nothing I can see at any rate to stop the Marxist from retorting that we can at least try. Secondly, again at the risk of sounding like a broken record, Marx doesn't have an issue with moral universality in principle, but rather with the universalistic pretensions of moralists in the service of a particular class. Because under conditions of class oppression, this pretension to universality is a lie. Concordantly, the need for distributive justice is predicated on the existence of the means of production being hoarded by a few in the form of private property. If the means of production are held by a universal class, then there is no inequality of material ownership such that a justice-enforcing body in its distribution is required. Again, we have to not think one-sidedly. As Keith himself points out, if we need an armed body to enforce the distribution of goods justly, then we aren't there yet, because the form of society follows from the form of production. If a universal class holds the means of production and produces for itself, then a morality serving that way of life is by definition also universal and already just, because there is no other class to be served unjustly. So Marxists really don't have a poverty of answers to moral questions. The simple fact is that unless you want to impute some kind of mystic cause to morality, it simply isn't that deep. And ultimately, beyond being a description of the particular interests that govern individual decision-making, attempts at a systematic and universal morality based on ideals alone serves only to denigrate the actual rich and most of all real love and loyalty that should be in its place. Marx's treatment of perennial and primordial loyalties to religious communities, to close family and to the extended family of the tribe has also tended to uh, be lacking. They tend to explain them away as aspects of the ideological superstructure like law and the rights of man, determined by and in service to the needs of the material base, the relations of the means of production. Thus, it's usually assumed that these kinds of loyalties will simply cease to exist under communism, with the corollary that revivals of these kinds of loyalties today are always necessarily in the service of capital. And this is where you get things like the Marxist explanation that the rise of populism, of fascism, of nationalism is a sign of capitalism in decay and is this uh, top-down elite social movement. None of these movements are actually challenging capital, and each targets something secondary to the actual concrete basis of our way of life and color over with their own fetishistic racial and religious utopianism the actual causes of misery and destitution in the world and provide cover for the hoarding of wealth and resources that is the principal issue. The vast majority of human production sits useless in the hands of a minority of useless people, while the rest pick sides based on skin color, nationality, and religion to fight each other endlessly for the scraps while the world slowly dies around them. But tribalism, in group preference for one's near and extended family and a sense of the sacred, these all precede not just capitalism but civilization itself by thousands of years. With respect to our sense of the sacred, quote-unquote, depending on what implications we want to attach to this word sacred, this is either positively incorrect or simply without basis. The rest is both undefended by citations or arguments, and I've already answered them anyways. Civilization grows with the breakdown of clan monopolies on individual loyalty. All the examples we have historically demonstrate this, and we have no other. Although neither were instances of communism proper, as conceived by Marx, the experiments of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia both ended with the revival of nationalism and religious sentiment after years of repression. And in the case of Yugoslavia, the most brutal ethnic conflict seen in Europe since the Second World War. The Chinese communist experiment, meanwhile, has gradually embraced Chinese nationalism and Confucianism as the means to maintain the unity and stability of the socialist project. Repression not successful elimination, whatever we may think of it. So there's no reason to think that this stuff ever went away. So to say it revived is just presumptuous. But more to the point, Keith is attempting to argue that nationalism is a kind of natural default that simply springs back like a weed, despite our hubristic attempts to put human nature under our thumb. He is wrong. 
We'll get into that in a moment, but with respect to China, this is a funny case. Given the cynicism with which the party has rehabilitated Confucius, I wonder if Keith ever considered why he is so quick to believe in the sincerity of its socialism. Food for thought. Faith, family, and extended folk have proved to be means by which the proletariat are united and moralized against the capitalist system. No, they've proved to be means, very effective means, by which the critique of capitalism can be convincingly propagandized as the purview of, I'm sorry, hateful narcissists and myopic idiots. And capitalism in its neoliberal form is now engaged in a crusade against each as an obstacle to its aim of a global homogenized market. Of course, Marx also believed that free trade would eliminate nations and organic ties, but saw this as a necessary progressive move toward communism. Still, everywhere people have come to identify as deracinated members of the human race has been in advanced capitalist societies, with much coercion and propagandizing from the capitalist class. And it seems rather unlikely that absent the overwhelming elite support for his transformation, people would not revert to the primordial pull of organic ties. And how are these ties to be mediated in a communist society? If tribalism, religiosity and the loyalties and commitments they entail will persevere under communism, how are conflicts of interest between these groups be mediated? Why will individuals choose advancing universal emancipation over loyalty to the various groups they feel organic ties to? And can we really say that the choice to choose those organic groupings that someone is a member of over uh, something as abstract as universal emancipation, can we really say that that is a sign of false consciousness, as the Marxists would tend to explain it away with? Yes. Yes, we can. You see, Keith's concept of the organic is impoverished. When he says organic, it doesn't really mean anything specific, it's just an elevator word that treats the ties in question as simply given, as natural. With the unspoken implication that defying these is to fight a losing battle with nature. However, organic ties are precisely what Marx wants to see flourish, albeit not the organism of the capitalist society where the end is the profit of one class, but the organism of a universal society where the end is not the accumulation of wealth by capitalists, but the human simpliciter as that which lives and feeds on human activity. Ergo, why he describes it as humanistic. But even assuming this equivocation between the organic and the natural, what Keith calls organic ties, are no such thing. They are as much the subject of historical evolution as any modern community, which includes, by the way, the imaginary of race, which is a remarkably recent invention born of class resentment by the newly deprived nobility of the French Revolution. See my video on the origin of the race concept for more details. Further, even in our prehistory, Say, as early as the settling of Europe, human groups weren't able to expand over such a vast range of environments through natural processes, i.e. biological evolution, alone. Their expansion was far too rapid for that, and was achieved through culture and technology, by devising the equipment that allowed them to survive. And what do we find at the center of the oldest clans known to history? Shelter and fire. The cult of the hearth. Even our sense of the sacred orbits, our means of production and subsistence. Ultimately, as well as remaining silent on the many practicalities and moral questions that will arise in a communist society, Marxism also retains a kind of moral blindness in that it makes irrelevant the interests of persons in the here and now, insofar as they have no bearing on the ultimate project of emancipation. As discussed, Marxism, like utilitarianism, is consequentialist. Utilitarianism also has in common with Marxist ethics a rejection of the notion of abstract human rights and deontological notions of justice. A consistent utilitarian would be willing to tolerate an individual instance of injustice if it served the greater good. However, though both may reject conventional moralism, Utilitarianism can always fall back on its rather simple first principle of the greatest good for the greatest many. By contrast, the long-range looking, perfectionist bent of Marxism means it has little to say about justice in the here and now. And this makes it much less sensitive to respecting the interests of people in the present and the near future. 
And one need only look at the instances of the attempted implementation of communism in the 20th century to see the extent to which this messianic ethic can justify all manner of evil and brutality. And Leon Trotsky, in his exchange with John Dewey, was just a person who uh, gave this its clearest expression in paper. This is actually incoherent. So we'll ignore that Keith just finished saying that these particular examples weren't of communism as described by Marx or by most Marxist theory. Fine, still all this points to again is a way in which the veneer of socialism can be used as justification for these things. Nothing in Marx's writings implies a normative preference for groups and a disinterest in individual human beings. The entire motive behind Marx is that the society makes the individual, gives them a place in the world and meaningful connections to make life worth living. To separate these is again to engage in a one-sided analysis. Capitalism, by contrast, forces us apart and against each other to painfully eke out a pittance. It robs us of real ties and forces us to seek a surrogate in abstract communities of race and creed that have no real substance. And of course, to start invoking the word evil here is probably uncontroversial in a folksy kind of way, but since Keith is directly challenging a philosophical stance on ethics, this is intrinsically silly. He hasn't put forward a standard by which these things in particular could be regarded as clearly quote-unquote evil, or as so evil that the evils which prevailed under the conditions which preceded the revolution which allowed these newer evils to be enacted couldn't still be considered worse. And finally, Keith has again forgotten that Dewey's whole point is that what the Marxists were proposing isn't simply consequentialism. It isn't consequentialist to refer one's particular actions to an extrinsic element, in this case class struggle, as a way to avoid having to justify them on the grounds of their immediate consequences. But the real criticism of Marxist ethics, ultimately, is their incoherence. Marxists can talk of exploitation, alienation, poverty, inequality, and injustice, and they can call all of those things bad, immoral, unjust, or evil. But what they cannot do consistently is say why any of these things are bad. Yes, they can. It's bad from the vantage of a particular class's interest. There's no mystery. If they were bad cosmically, then the Marxist mission would be in the realm of ideas like the young Hegelians, not in material history, not in class struggle. Marxism explains away morality as ideology in service of the ruling class. It states that all morality hitherto has been class morality, but then attacks capitalism on the basis of moral judgments, and contains an ethic of emancipation which is assumed to be superior to the current state of affairs. Again for the universal class. Without any objective basis for moral discussions, on what basis can Marx himself affirm his ideal of freedom as superior? How can Marx claim his ethic is free from the constraints and influences that he uses to write off what he considers the various forms of bourgeois morality? On the basis of its universality. It's a freedom that isn't also the slavery of someone else. And if Marx has really conceived of an ethic of freedom and a resulting moral system independently of the needs of the economic base, then would that not contradict his commitment to historical materialism and his insistence that morality is a function of ideology? He doesn't. If Marxian ethics are indeed independent and an exception to this rule, then why can't other systems of ethics that Marx attacks make the same claim to independence? In other words, as soon as Marxists affirm their own ethic, they thereby undermine the basis for their repudiation of all other moral systems. No, they don't. The economic base is of the ruling class, and thus is what directs the morality of the ruling class. Ergo, if the economic base changes, so does the prevailing morality. If the ruling class isn't universal, then when it claims its morality as universal, it tells itself, as well as the classes over which it rules, a lie. If the ruling class is universal, however, then the morality is also universal, and its claim to universality, it obviously follows, is true. And it is from this vantage that self-conscious Marxists engage in unabashed moralism with all right. This isn't hard to grasp, and if I'm being brutally honest, I wonder here just how carefully Keith read Marx prior to making this video. Because Marx is pretty rigorously systematic, he's a good old German tome factory, and he covers this stuff ad nauseum. In any case, to sum up my response to Keith, no, 
Marx's position on ethics was not incoherent, not at least in the vulgar ways pointed out by Keith here. This is an illustration of why it's so important to have respect, to show respect for what you're studying, even if your goal is ultimately to dismantle it. Keith is embedded in circles where an unjustified bigotry against Marx and his students prevails unchallenged, and like all bigotries do, this makes them more than trivially wrong, it makes them quite stupid. Keith is an individual operating in dishonest and wicked circles, and while he shares in no small part of this, he isn't by nature, at least in my experience, stupid. This both makes him more culpable for the aforementioned, but it also perhaps makes him amenable to this final message. Keith, try harder. As always, thank you for listening, and take care.